Hello everybody, welcome back to Computer Science 3200. Um, today, we actually have the last lecture of the term, the last normal lecture, where I'm going to give a, a very, very brief introduction to deep neural networks. Um, essentially, just enough to know as a teaser, like what the current state of the art is and uh, how it's being used. And then in the next lecture, um, you are going to watch the AlphaGo movie. I will prepare a lecture to that or a, a link to that and I'll put it here. And then there is no final lecture here. Uh, I am reserving that. I may do something where I um, have like a office hour on uh, Discord or something like that to answer questions about the exam. So this is the final lecture of the year. So why not just get started with it? Um, so here we go. Oops, I don't have the uh, chat open for questions. Just give me one second. I always forget to open that. Let me know if you can hear me out there. I think the volume is fine. Yeah, it should be fine. All right. So final lecture of the year. Lecture number 19, Deep Neural Networks and Deep Learning. So some resources if you're more interested in deep learning is the Deep Learning Book and Dive Into Deep Learning. These are excellent resources that will tell you much, much more um, than what is, what is going on in this lecture. So Deep Neural Networks. Uh, we talked about neural networks last time, and if you're watching this, you should have watched that other video on how to implement a neural network. So you should be very familiar with what a neural net is by now. And neural networks that have, um, what is a deep neural network? Um, essentially, a deep neural network is a neural network that has many, many, many hidden layers. So lots of weights um, to figure out and lots of neurons and lots of, um, lots of hidden layers. They also have extra processing. So just because you have a big neural network doesn't necessarily make it a deep neural network. I have not found an exact definition of a deep neural network, but essentially it's a very large neural network that has extra processing added into it. Um, they have been popular since 2012 when uh, Jeffrey Hinton and his uh, paper came out. And uh, the rise of GPU computing power has really made uh, deep neural networks a feasible computation wise. Um, so you combine multiple techniques um, which are specific in different domains and you combine them all together and you get deep neural networks. So uh, one of the areas that deep neural networks are very, very useful in is in image processing. And so one of the ways that I want to kind of explain what a deep neural network is and some of the, the components that go into a deep neural network is with image processing in mind because it's very intuitive in terms of explaining the different components. So here is a screenshot from, uh, again, Jeffrey Hinton's 2012 paper of the ImageNet classification problem. And they were very successfully um, able to classify uh, images based on uh, different categories of image. So the first bit of extra processing that goes into a lot of deep neural networks are called convolutions. And convolutions do not have to be in necessarily deep neural networks, but networks that use convolutions are called convolu convolutional neural networks or CNNs. So let's say, for example, we want to explain what a convolution is, but in terms of um, uh, neural nets. So here, uh, let me turn off the camera for a second so you can see what this up in the top right is. It's just a three by three kernel. So let's say we're going to use image processing to explain what, what kernels are and what convolutions are. So let's say we have some input image. Um, so here is our image right here in the middle. That is some 2D grid of pixels, for example. It, it doesn't necessarily have to be pixels. It doesn't have to be an image, but it makes more sense if we explain it that way. So let's have a neuron that looks over, for example, a three by three pixel area and produces an output, okay? So this three by three area is going to look at an input and produce some output. And I'll have an animation here in a second. That area or that grid is called the kernel, okay? So the next neuron will look at a small shift of a new area. And so what, what exactly is happening here? 
So here is a little animation. And over here we have um, a, an example of a three by three kernel going over a four by four area. And so what happens is each of these three by three areas of which there are four of them in a four by four image, we do some processing on that three by three area. You could do a bunch of different processing. For example, you could sum up and average the pixels or you could take the maximum pixel. Um, what we typically do, I'll, I'll explain on the next slide, but something is done with that three by three area and the output of that function is a single input into the next layer, okay? So what we get over here um, is we get a large image. We move this, for example, it could be three by three, it could be larger, it could be smaller um, area around the image to produce a second image based on the application of that kernel to the previous layer, all right? So one thing that we typically use these um, convolutional kernels for is for edge detecting. Um, so this kernel detects change. So for example, if you take uh, one kernel in the X direction and one kernel in the Y direction, and you take the negatives of those, and so what we're doing here is the matrix application, you take these, you multiply the values, you sum them up, and what you get uh, from an input image like this is you get a slightly smaller edge detected image like this and what this does essentially is it detects change in your image from um, when pixels go from one value to a drastically different value they will be detected um, as bright spots in this edge detected image and so you apply this kernel these kernels to the image and the output image is the edge image or the edge detected image and so convolutional neural networks use this to group and detect features. And it helps us because the way we process images as humans and animals and also now as neural nets is that the interesting features of images typically come around the edges. And so if we take an image and we discard a bunch of the data that's not super interesting and just look at the edges, it can make this processing much, much easier. So... This image is from a, a talk about deep neural networks. Um, oh, the source down here is, it's from Unsupervised Learning of Hierarchical Representations of Combinational Deep Neural Networks. Um, that's the name of the talk. But essentially what we do is we take the image and we run it through a kernel. And then that kernel produces an image which is edge detected. And as we saw last time, neural nets progressively with each hidden layer detect more and more um, patterns on patterns on patterns. But the first thing we look at is those edges. So we have patterns of edges, then patterns of patterns of edges, then patterns and patterns and patterns of edges. So that convolutional step to a deep neural network is very, very important, especially when we're looking at two-dimensional image processing. Another technique that's used is called pooling. Um, there's min pooling and max pooling. We'll just take max pooling because one's just the opposite of the other. And so the output from the convolution produces another matrix. And now what we're going to do is we're going to take maximums from areas of that matrix, max pooling. And this forms another matrix and the process is called pooling. So up here, for example, I'm gonna hide my camera again. We have one matrix up here and we're gonna chop this into four areas. We, uh, we're color coding them here. So what we do is we take each of those color coded areas and we take the maximum of those. And so we take the 20 from here, the 30 from here, the 37 from here, and the 112 from here, and we form a smaller er, a smaller matrix based on um, that, that process. So up here, we had these different pools of values, and we maxed each of those pools. It's called max pooling. Then we can repeat that process over and over. And so what you can kind of view this as is taking the most important features from particular areas of the image, right? And again, we don't always apply this to image processing, but it is very effective in image processing. So we do convolution and max pooling, and we could repeat that any number of times, 100, I, I think I meant to say 10 here, 100 might be a little bit uh, uh, much. And then we can optionally run the result of that output through another convolution, and another pooling process. And so the output is then run through a fully connected neural network and we can learn something about it. So if you're reading these papers about the structures of deep neural networks, you see something like this, where you have an image, 
you apply a convolution to that image. Then you apply pooling, where you take the new the output image and you shrink it down. So now you have um, like more condensed features, I would say. That's how I look at it. Then you might may, may apply a new convolutional step and then a new pooling step, and then you might have a fully connected network after that. And then this network is pretty large. You run it on a bunch of GPUs and you learn stuff, right? So maybe it's a dog with this probability, it's a boat with this probability. And here's just another example of this uh, down here. So back in the day, um, in 1998, this is when uh, convolutions were first used in neural nets, and that's uh, Jan LeCun back in 1998. I think he's still at Facebook AI Research right now. Um, I, I talked to him a few times, he's a really nice guy. And so back in 1998, they were doing this sort of thing to, um, to recognize Im handwriting in images. And so this worked really, really well. And back in the day, we had 10 to the six transistors in our processors, and the number of pixels that were used in the training step was a few million, okay? Now, <laughs> we have like, in, well, in 2012 with Jeffrey Hinton's paper, they used 10 to the power of 14. So um, uh, I'd say 10 million times 10 million uh, pixels used in their training set. So it was much, much, much larger, the training set for that. So similar type of ideas. This is not a new idea. It was just finally applied to a large scale um, on a large scale. And what we get out of that is we get some um, really cool learning algorithms. So, uh, we, so these ReLU steps, those are the activation functions that we talked about last time. And so there's all sorts of layers in these networks. They get really, really complicated and we get, um, features that look like this. So you can see here, um, we get feature hierarchies between the different layers as layers go on. So you can see sort of car features here. So and in the earlier layers, we would see, okay, this is like, maybe we can see a wheel here, part of a door handle, something like that. And then eventually in the later layers, we are actually detecting entire cars. Similarly, um, with an elephant detector that was trained here, we can see, okay, this is some tusks and some ears. And finally, in one of the later layers, we can see actual elephants, similar with chairs, et cetera, et cetera. There are lots of different connections in these neural nets. These are extremely large things and they take a long time to train, but modern hardware has made this sort of thing tractable. So we get um, good results from them. Um, these techniques are only recently possible due to massive comp computing power. Um, oh, let me say that I'm really hand-waving over a lot of this stuff. Um, I'm just wanting to give you the idea of what a deep neural network is, not exactly how it works, not exactly um, like all of the mathematics behind it. I know that they have vastly different shapes and vastly different sizes, but I just kind of, you to, kind of want you to know what they are. They are just a high performance neural network, we'll say, that has some of these features built in. So basically the reason these have become recently popular in the last decade is because massive increases in computing power in computing power gpu computation stuff like that gpus are absolutely everywhere they're cheap to manufacture and so what gpus do is instead of say having one cpu running at four gigahertz they have a thousand cpus running at one gigahertz or something like that right so we we have massive parallelism and the cool thing about neural networks is that all of these connections this fully connected neural network is basically entirely parallelizable. And so you can run it in parallel. Oh, inherently parallel. So yeah, what we do, we take a modern computer, we say, screw that, um, that those cores are fast, but there's not enough of them. And then we take a GPU with hundreds of cores. And then the cool thing is, since we are doing um, the dot product, what was the dot product? Well, it's taking X1, multiplying it with double W1, uh, X2 with W2, X3 with W3. So you have all of these weights multiplied by all of these inputs and all of those multiplications can be done in parallel and then you sum the result of all those things. And sums can be done in parallel as well. You could say sum the first half and sum the second half at the same time and then sum the two at the end. So neural networks are inherently parallel and all of these GPU uh, all of these GPU cores can be completely saturated in computing this, um, this neural network. So it's really cool. Here's another thing um, that is very popular in, in neural networks in general, but also in deep neural networks, is that you have something called an autoencoder. And so in an autoencoder, um, you have an input layer 
and you have an output layer. The input layer is the same size as the output layer. And so the point of an autoencoder is that there is a hidden layer which is smaller than the input layer. And so our target values are these XIs. And so what an autoencoder does, the way we train it, is by saying, I want to pass my inputs through a smaller hidden layer. And then it goes back out to an output layer the same size as the input layer. And what I would like to do is have the output layer be the same as the input. So what's happening there is you're taking some data, you're passing it through a smaller structure, and then it's going back to a larger structure that you hope is the same as the input layer. And so what's this called? Well, this, oops, I don't know why that just appeared. This is called compression. So you can have a neural network that does compression for you, which is really cool because you're learning an intermediate representation, which is smaller than the actual representation, but you can sort of decompress back to the full image. So here are some examples of some like uh, basic autoencoders where you feed it in an image, it's going to learn an autoencoder of a smaller representation, and then that uh, autoencoder uh, produces, tries to produce the original image again. And so what you get is what kind of what you expect, like a lower resolution compressed version of that input image. And so autoencoding kind of generalizes inputs. It can be seen as a sort of uh, form of compression. Deep neural nets uh, use autoencoders pretty frequently. Um, unlike our demo though, due to these generalizations, it's often difficult to understand what the DNN is doing and what features it is extracting. So because of all of this stuff that's going on, um, it's kind of difficult to understand exactly what is going on inside a deep neural net. And so it's actually a huge field of research right now where researchers are saying, okay, what is going on inside a deep neural net? We are going to take steps to actually do research to say, um, what are we learning? How can we learn it faster? How exactly are these patterns being matched and stuff? So there's a big, um, big push for more understandability, we'll say, in deep learning. Uh, dropout is, is a, another important thing that happen, can happen in deep neural nets and in neural nets in general. Um, so the curse of the neural net is that it can get stuck in local maxima, right? This process of gradient descent does not necessarily find global optima, it finds local optima. And so what dropout does is the following. Let's say on every iteration, we're going to flip a coin for each neuron, and depending on the output, if it's tails, we're going to keep it on, if it's heads, we're going to turn it off. And on the next iteration, you drop out a different set. So you keep flipping coins. And what happens here is that this is going to help us prevent from getting stuck in local maxima as well as overfitting to data. So what is this doing? Well, if we do drop out, then we are effectively turning off some neurons while we're learning, right? So what this does is it makes the neural network more robust, we'll say. Um, because it's learning to predict things even if some of its neurons get turned off. So for example, um, like part of my brain, if I ever got like a lobotomy, if part of my brain got damaged, some of my processing ability would still remain and some of it would not, right? So in dropout, they, um, it's a way for our neural networks to be more robust in training. Drop connect is another thing that we can do where we artificially turn on or off connections in the neural network. And this is actually like a superset of dropout. So you can tell, you can sort of think of dropout as a special case of drop connect where all of the inputs to a specific neuron are being dropped. All right. So now we know sort of what a neural net is, sort of what, or what a deep neural net is and sort of some of the things that go into a deep neural net. So what is deep reinforcement learning? Well, we talked about tabular reinforcement learning so far in this course. Let me go back and um, put animations on here. Here we go. So we talked about tabular reinforcement learning, which is when I can store the values in a table, right? So assignment five, we can store the values in a table. Our grid is not that large. Um, so we have a discrete state representation, meaning that our states are like, 
are, are discrete. We have individual states. We don't have real valued stuff. We have low dimensional data. So we can store our policy in a table. We can store our values in a table. However, most problems that are interesting do not fit in a table like that. And so what we need is some other way of storing our values and storing our policy that goes beyond a table. And so we require a function, a function approximator. So QSA is the result of a function and not a table lookup. So if we want to keep estimates for our Q values, but we have too many of them to fit in memory, we can use a function approximator and we can use neural, net, uh, neural nets. They're a very good function approximator. So enter deep Q networks. So deep Q networks or DQN was one of the first great breakthroughs in deep reinforcement learning. Basically the first algorithm that came along that said, um, okay, deep reinforcement learning is actually something that we need to look at. And so it uses a deep convolutional neural network for function approximation to approximate the optimal Q star of SA. And it uses a modified version of Q learning that changes when some updates are performed to encourage uh, convergence. So if we look at this paper, Human Level Control Through Deep Reinforcement Learning, this is uh, colloquially known as the Atari paper, so they, they learn to play Atari. Essentially what they're doing in this paper is Q learning, but with deep neural networks. So here is the update rule. I don't know why my computer is lagging all of a sudden. That's really strange. Um, so if you look at this update rule, this is their estimates, okay? That's stored in the deep neural network. And this is sort of the update to the weights. And if you look over here, you see reward plus gamma times max A prime of Q S prime A prime minus Q of S A. That's the Q learning update rule. And so they're doing Q learning Except the hand wavy part of all this is that instead of a table where you store discrete values for QSA, you use a neural network that is trying to predict the values of QSA. And then what they did, they took, one second, my computer is being all weird. Oh, geez, what have I done? What have I done? Okay. All right, now we're back to, to back to 60 FPS, good. Um, so what they did, they took the inputs from an Atari screen. They did convolutions on those and max pooling and all sorts of cool stuff. Then they have a fully connected network over here and their output is what they should do whenever you see this on the screen. So what they did was directly learn a policy network. So they are learning what to do at a specific time in the game based on some feedback. So maybe, for example, they learned by watching humans play, or maybe they, they learned by self-play. This is what we'll see um, ended up happening later on in AlphaGo. So in our next lecture, we don't have any more actual lectures where I'm speaking, but you are going to watch the AlphaGo documentary. There will be a question about it on the exam. It's actually an amazing movie, you know, go make some snacks and, and watch this movie. And what I'm going to do here is show you how everything we have learned so far in this term went into making AlphaGo. Okay, it's actually really cool how it all tied together. So the original version of AlphaGo combined deep learning with heuristic search. Now, Google didn't like to promote the fact that they were using heuristic search because it's a bit of an old term. So they just basically said it was deep learning, but they really did use heuristic search, a form of search called Monte Carlo tree search. And two networks were trained in AlphaGo. They trained a value network, which is essentially their heuristic function. Remember in assignment three for connect four, how you had to make a heuristic function for connect four. Well, what they did was they actually played a bunch of replays and learned from this state who won the game. And that, for example, if you're in a particular state and um, the black player, the pr player playing the black pieces um, ended up winning 90% of the games from that state, then that's probably a really good state for black, right? So they learned this value network and they also learned a policy network, which was given that state, what was the move that the human was most likely to do next? So they learned this value network and this policy network. So the first thing they did was they had to have some data to learn from. 
So they had hundreds of thousands of uh, professional human games, all those, um, the, the game moves. So I wouldn't say replays, but they're essentially replays. So for the policy network, the input was the state of the game and the target was that the move the human performed. So they tried to use the deep neural net to, um, as, in, as the input image was the game of the board and the target that they were trying to learn was the move that the human performed in that state. So they're trying to learn a policy. They also learned the value network where the input was the state and the target is who won the game from that state, right? So if the network is very sure that white is going to win from this state, then that's a good state for white. If it's not exactly sure, then uh, probably both players are tied at that point. So once it, it, it learned all it could from the humans, it started playing against itself and it continued to learn, it continued to get stronger. And now since it got stronger, it's learning to play against a stronger person. And so it's sort of this uh, cool positive feedback loop where you get stronger and stronger and stronger. Um, then what happened is they made this version called AlphaGo Zero. And AlphaGo Zero threw out the stage where they learned from human replays. And it learned entirely from self-play. It still uses MCTS to play games against itself to choose actions, but... Um, it didn't have that initial step of, of learning from humans. So it learned which moves were good from self-play using deep reinforcement learning. It actually converged faster and used less computation than the original version of AlphaGo. And they showed that it actually worked well for chess as well. So here's a little slide. I'm not going to read all of this, but it's self-play reinforcement learning from AlphaGo Zero. Um, and so you can see here that they were using heuristic search um, to guide the reinforcement learning. So they weren't using um, search for the end policy like they were in the original AlphaGo, but they were using um, a form of Monte Carlo tree search in order to guide the actions for the reinforcement learning itself. And so you can see um, these diagrams here. This is the Monte Carlo tree search that was used in AlphaGo 0. So yes, there was still some heuristic search used in AlphaGo 0. And so why did they do this approach? It was because Go has a very large branching factor. At any point, there's like 300 places that you can move on the game of Go. And so if you look 300 times 300 times 300 times 300, that branching factor gets way too um, large for heuristic search. And so if you talk to a human about like how they play chess or how they play Go, um, they don't say, well, I look over every possible move, that's silly. Humans have sort of learned over the course of their life which types of moves are good and which types of moves are bad. And so they prune this 300 branching factor down very, very small. And Gary Kasparov was very famous for having said that in a given chess game, he only looked at two moves per turn, which is incredible. And so AlphaGo learned a policy network. And from that policy network, you could input a state, and instead of having to search all 300 possible moves, you take the moves that maybe the three or four most likely moves that were output from the policy network, and now it can narrow the heuristic search down to only consider the moves in the policy network. And not only that, but it also needs a good heuristic function, and that heuristic function was its value network. So it's kind of crazy how it all ties together. We can go all the way back to heuristic search. We have, you know, uh, uh, Minimax, Alpha Beta, Monte Carlo Tree Search. Then we have um, neural networks. We have reinforcement learning. We have deep neural networks being used as the value networks for deep, deep reinforcement learning. It's just the whole term, everything that we learned is now coming together to make these really cool agents. And so then um, this is a, a group of people who made the DeepStack Poker AI. Uh, most of these people were actually in the same lab that I was in uh, at the University of Alberta. A lot of them work for Google now. <clears throat> but what they did was they used the same type of thing where they played a bunch of games to learn a value network. And then they used search on top of that um, and used the value network to uh, predict what was the best states to search and what was the best, uh, what were states that they want to, to avoid. But they also use this thing called um, uh, a deep counterfactual network. Um, what is it called? Uh, what was the name of their algorithm before they had the deep learning example? So there was an extra step on top of all of this. Um, counterfactual regret. Oh, geez. CFR. 
counterfactual regret minimization. I think, I think that's what it was. So what they would do in the original version before this, they would do something, and I apologize if any of them are watching, which they're not, and I get this a little bit wrong, but you play a hand of poker, and the way you learn is you go back, and after the hand is played, you look at what the cards were that everyone had, and you calculate a regret, right? So, oh, having if I had known that they had this, I would have made this other move, right? How different is the move that I made from the move that I would have made if I knew what they had? That's a form of regret. And this learning process was in there such that the policy they produce minimizes that regret. And so that's a very top level way of sort of looking at it, but they combine this with deep learning and, and heuristic search and they get a poker player that's better than humans. Cool, so deep learning is magic, right? Um, it turns out that despite all of the things that deep learning has done, it is not perfect. And so, for example, what would you say you see in these images? Well, if a human looked at these two images, we'd say that it's a school bus. After a deep neural net has learned a significant amount, it would probably also say that it was a school bus, right? So if you take, um, say, a million images and there's 10,000 different categories of images, the neural net can pretty well learn at this point what category this fits into. However, in a particular example, the neural net thinks that this one on the left-hand side is a school bus, but this one on the right-hand side is an ostrich. And you might say, well, that's a pretty dumb neural net, or is it? Turns out it's kind of easy to trick deep learning. At least it is at this point. A lot of deep learning algorithms um, are very easily trickable. So if you feel super safe driving around in your Tesla, let's hope someone doesn't uh, do some uh, adversarial learning against your Tesla's vision algorithm. What happens is you take in an image that it can correctly predict and you add some noise to that image. Now, if you remember what a, what a neural network does, it essentially just does a bunch of multiplications and additions, right? A bunch of dot products. So if you can find the exact changes of the weights that make the image sort of look the same, but the values produce different outputs on the neural network, you can trick a neural network into thinking that these things are ostriches. You can trick it into thinking anything is an ostrich. And the way that you do this is by using another deep neural network that as inputs, right, you feed in the image that it thinks should be actually predicted well by that system. And then you are learning the distortion that you have to add to that image such that their new prediction is terrible. Okay? So you can trick deep neural networks into thinking that these, like, statically these static images are what is predicted here and that these things like this is a penguin this is a starfish this is a baseball so deep neural networks are an amazing feat of engineering that produce spectacular results but the last thing i want to sort of leave you with is that they are not magic they are just mathematics and it turns out they're pretty easy to fool if you know how to fool them now that being said there is an entire field of deep learning that is like anti-fooling deep learning. <laughs> so this is just like this adversarial game going back and forth where you try and trick, trick each other as, as much as possible. So there is so much that I could talk about in with deep neural networks, but I'm going to leave you at that. I'm going to leave you with enough knowledge um, that won't explode your brain, but it will allow you to um, sort of get this taste in your mouth for like, oh, what, what could we do with all of this? And if you look here, the AlphaGo movie, uh, by the time you watch this, I will have a link here. I think it's free on YouTube right now. So I will have uh, a link there. If it's not on YouTube, then I will put it on D2L. I've been given permission from, um, uh, from Google. They sent me the movie to show to students. And so you're gonna watch that movie and it's such a good movie. It's not just a documentary. There's like drama, there's emotion. Um, I know several of the people who worked on that project and, and it's such a great movie. I, I really love watching it. I watch it like once a year now. So please go watch that. It will be on the final exam. And we can see now how people say, what is the best AI? Is it search? Is it genetic algorithms? Is it learning? 
Well, it turns out it's a combination of everything, right? Nobody produces the best thing. We all share from each other's knowledge. We take the things that were made in the 1950s, we make some improvements to them. We take the, the, the neural networks that were made back in the 70s, 80s, we make some improvements to them. And then we tie them all together and we get these really amazing systems that are able to solve really cool problems. So the last thing I wanna leave you with is that there is no single best technique for solving artificial intelligence. And the best thing you can do is to borrow ideas from everything we have learned and tie them all together and see what sort of cool systems you can make. So that, uh, with bittersweetness, is the last official lecture of the term. I hope you enjoyed uh, watching the course as much I, as I enjoyed um, giving the course. This is always a really fun one to do. Um, for the students, I will see you at the final exam. Do not uh, forget to submit assignment five by the due date next week. And um, for the last lecture, I will uh, announce on D2L what we're going to do with that. So thank you all so much for tuning in. And um, I will see you next year for the next version of this course. And maybe we'll include some of the new techniques that are found over the course of the next year. Thanks again, and uh, I'll see you in the next one.